Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylord. And I'm Dan Barker. Annie Laurie and I are co presidents of the Freedom from Religion Foundation, which produces this weekly show. Today, we're going to meet a prominent Catholic journalist who will tell us how American bishops are playing God and promoting Christian nationalism. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. Just how powerful are American Catholic bishops and where does their power come from? Our guest today will tell us exactly how the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops is playing God. Mary Jo McConaughey is a journalist with a distinguished career. She's been a war correspondent covering the Central American insurgencies in the 1980s. Her books include The Tango War, The Struggle for the Hearts, Minds, and Riches of Latin America during World War II, and the multiple award-winning Maya Rhodes, One Woman's Journey Among the People of the Rainforest. Ms. McConaughey's newest book is called Playing God, American Catholic Bishops and the Far Right, in which she documents how U.S. bishops are using dark money and align with ultra-right evangelicals in an attempt to make America a Christian nation, especially a Catholic Christian nation. Mary Jo McConaughey is joining us from California, and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. I really enjoyed your book, Playing God, Mary Jo. It's an, an incisive book. It gives quite a, a history of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops and many sketches of the major right-wing Catholic and evangelical players who are battling to reshape our country in their image. So what prompted you to write a book like this? January 6th, uh, 2020, I, like so many of us, I was watching in real time the uh, speech of then still President uh, Trump and the people gathering outside the Capitol. And I, I realized he had given them sort of the permission, kind of a baptize the groups there to be a shock troops going for the Capitol. I have lived through coups. I've reported on coups. And uh, the big question was whether the military was going to stand with the autocrat or uh, defend whatever the symbol of the democracy was. And, you know, for a while, it looked as if it could go either way. And when the cameras were on these crowds, I saw crucifixes, symbols of Christianity, uh, symbols, I'm a believer, symbols that were dear to me growing up and still are. And it, I, I was shocked and it occurred to me that they are, this is Christian nationalism. They are trying to upset the democratic system for their own purposes and I saw Catholics speaking to the cameras, and I said, well, where did the bishops start uh, stand on all of this? And where are the bishops, by the way? And that's what got me started to write the book. I think there are a number of books that had their genesis with January 6th. And by the way, where did the bishops stand on this? Well, in fact, 
two bishops, one of them a U.S. bishop, were giving forth the night before, the day before, the Jericho on the Jericho march. This is Bishop Strickland. The point of the book is that so much that the bishops did over the years is what led to an atmosphere in which this kind of thing could happen, in which Catholics and Protestants uh, and, and all kinds of uh, faith-minded people felt free to participate, even though it was an anti-democratic uh, anti -democratic, uh, um, effort. We had, of course, the COVID. We were in the midst of the COVID. Uh, so many of the bishop tried to undermine the authority of the state. That's a prime characteristic of Christian nationalism, undermining the authority of the state. Pope Francis, by the way, made it very clear, obey the medical and health authorities. We're all in this together. The bishops of the United States, for various reasons, are very much opposed to the stance of Pope Francis, and this was another occasion in which they could oppose him. But I think that they built up this threat to democracy in other ways, too. Uh, they came to identify over the last, I would say, 30 years with what the Republican Party has become, not the Republican Party of our childhoods. Uh, my, my grandfather was a state official in the state of Indiana, a, a Democrats, and he talked to uh, Republicans. <laughs> there, They were people that the Democrats could talk to. Uh, the Republican Party today is different, and the bishops are embedded with them. Uh, and they mark, they are marked by, why, by what they have failed to do, it seems to me. That is, uh, they have spoken out against voter suppression. Now, you write that the U.S. bishops don't reflect the global Catholic Church. To, to what degree are the American bishops out of step with Pope Francis? They're very much out of step. Take what they call their primary spirit, uh, spiritual issue is abortion. And that, of course, is what got them hooked up with the Republican Party. And I might say... Uh, with evangelical Christians, white evangelical Christians. Abortion is such an American issue. And Pope Francis believes that there are other pro-life issues that are equally important, such as capital punishment, such as care for the environment. He's very, very serious about climate change. And that is something with which he is uh, in opposition with the U.S. bishops, who frankly get a lot of their money from fossil fuel companies. And this is the most wealthy bishops' conference in the world. So even though they may be out of step with Pope Francis, they are extremely powerful in the global church. So the picture you paint in your book, fascinating book, with a, a broad history of this whole thing happening, is that the American Catholic bishops are sort of outliers in the global scene. What about the average American Catholic? How does the average American Catholic churchgoer relate to either the Vatican or to the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops? Well, Catholics in the United States, as everywhere else, recognize the, uh, Pope Francis as, as, as the Pope. Um, they are... Uh, in favor of the Pope's point of view on abortion. That is, it is, uh, it is against the Catholic faith, but then again, it need not be, it ought not be the preeminent political issue or the pre preeminent issue that guides everything we do. You know, the bishops attempted to keep Holy Communion, which is a prime element of Catholicism for, for Catholics, uh, tried to keep the president of the United States from, who is a practicing Catholic from keeping, uh, from going to communion. They tried to, uh, well, our own bishop in San Francisco, I'm speaking to you from San Francisco, uh, has forbidden uh, Nancy Pelosi to receive right. communion. Um, Dick Durbin, uh, 
the chair of one of the most important committees, the Judicial Committee in the Congress, has been forbidden by his bishop to receive Holy Communion. Now, polls show, and I, t I talk about them in my book, the polls show that most Catholic Americans, for instance, want to entertain the idea of female priests and definitely female deacons. That is completely verboten uh, for the bishops. They don't even want to talk about it. Most Catholic clergy, male clergy, do not want to talk about it. Uh, Catholic nuns do want to talk about it. This is what all the polls show. So in some ways, the bishop, well, in many ways, the bishops are not only out of step on the global church and the global church, but also with the church in the States. Wow. So in your book, you point out that um, Catholics early in American history were very supportive of keeping state and church separate. And some of the earliest cases against Bible reading and prayer in schools were taken by Catholic families. Isn't that true? Yes, that's absolutely true, because Catholics were a minority in this country. Um, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants were the rule makers. They were, there was only one Catholic involved in the writing the Declaration of Independence. There were very few ever uh, Catholics on the Supreme Court. Uh, Catholics were a minority that needed protection. Uh, as we know, things have changed. For instance, with, this, with the Supreme Court, the entire conservative majority was brought up Catholic, uh, six, out of the, uh, six out of the nine. So the ca Catholics were very much for separation of church and state. The other reason they were for separation of church and state was because so many of the Catholics were immigrants. And they, there was a lot of anti-immigration, uh, um, which meant, at, at the time, anti-Catholic uh, public demonstrations and things. And they, uh, Catholics had to really show that they were Americans. They had to bend over backwards. Now, by the 80s, uh, certain ultra-right-wing Catholics, uh, especially uh, people who had become part of the government of Ronald Reagan and a, uh, uh, various people who were traditionalist Catholics. That's really conservative. That's beyond being a conservative Catholic. Um, decided that they wanted to bring the country back to the principles of the founding fathers as they, as they saw them. Uh, they saw that abortion, for instance, was an important issue. They felt that they didn't have the numbers, and so they needed to join up with evangelical Christians, whose big issue at the time, we're talking the 70s, 80s, was segregation. They wanted to keep blacks and whites separate and to protect their separate schools. And uh, one of the foremost Catholic activists um, went to uh, Jerry Falwell and said, look, together we can make a moral majority in this country to bring our country back to the ideology of our founding fathers. Uh, segregation is not an attractive issue. Abortion mm -hmm. needs to be the issue on which we plant this flag. Very that cynical. Was that so, was Paul Weyrich, wasn't it? It was. It yeah. was Paul Weyrich. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people uh, don't realize extremely important that he, that he was Catholic, not yeah. evangelical Protestant. We need to go out for a break, but before right. we do, um, since your book has come out, we have seen this startling development in Oklahoma, and, and in fact, the Freedom from Religion Foundation is suing over it, where the Diocese of Tulsa and Archdiocese of Oklahoma City petitioned the Oklahoma Virtual School Board to create a Catholic public charter school, which is going to be supported all by tax dollars, and that is a contradiction in terms. And do you have any thought on this development? Well, it's such a jaw dropper. <laughs> it's such a jaw dropper, including for Catholics who know our own history 
and who know that we have fought to keep our Catholic schools separate. And now look what's happening. It's very cynical. A Catholic public school seems like a contradiction in terms, doesn't it? So we're going to take a break, Mary Jo. We're speaking with Mary Jo McConaughey, a journalist and author of the new book, Playing God. We'll be right back after this. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. When I first recorded that commercial back in 2014, being openly atheist in America was still fairly uncommon. Today, the fastest growing religious group in the country is the non-religious, especially among the young. That progress is heartening, but the religious pushback is fierce and the forces of Christian nationalism are well organized. Our progress won't continue unless we work together so that reason and our secular constitution will prevail. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. I'm Chris Calvey, and I am proud to be an out-of-the-closet atheist. I'm Chris, and I may look like Jesus, but I'm an atheist. And you know, atheists are sometimes accused of leading lives that are cold and bleak and meaningless, but that's not the way I see it. To me, I don't believe that there's an afterlife. And that realization that this might be the only chance we have makes my life feel incredibly important every day. Also, knowing that help is not going to come from above imparts on me a profound sense of urgency to work together to solve the world's problems and alleviate human suffering. That's why my purpose in life is to try and leave planet Earth a little bit better than it was the way I found it. I'm a graduate student, I'm studying microbiology, and I'm trying to develop renewable biofuels before it's too late. I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute, where no religious body seeks to impose its will, directly or indirectly, upon the general populace. Let's restore respect for America's secular roots. Help the Freedom From Religion Foundation defend the wall of separation between state and church. Join us at FFRF.org. Freedom depends on freethinkers. And welcome back to Free Thought Matters. Our guest is the journalist Mary Jo McConaughey. She is a Catholic and the author of a book that is very critical of American Catholic bishops. The book's called Playing God, American Catholic Bishops and the Far Right. So Mary Jo, let's talk about some of the money issues that you bring up because where do they get their power? Who are some of the big money donors to Catholic and Christian nationalist causes? One of the most important alliances is between uh, Tim Bush, who runs the Napa Summer Institute, which is going on right now. I was just up there. Um, and this is where far-right bishops can uh, hobnob and uh, backslap with far-right Catholics. Uh, it's an important place. Uh, Mike Pence, who was uh, grew up Catholic but became uh, an evangelical Christian, was the keynote speaker hmm. this year. Kim Bush and Charles Koch are business partners, and Charles Koch now uh, funds some, I don't know, 30, 40 uh, uh, Catholic universities because he wants to push his idea of capitalism, uh, and it's very plain, he says it right out, uh, and to show how it can allied with Catholic values, which a, a lot of people object to. A, a very important with the dark money that you bring up is um, the chapter in my book that I call Unholy Trinity. And it focuses on, the, uh, on Char Clarence Thomas, Ginny Thomas, and most importantly for the money, Leonard Leo. 
Leonard Leo has uh, a new tranche of money, 1.6 billion. He's a court whisperer. And he is the one who helped to nominate all of these. He, he was the money behind the court that we have today. And I should say, do I have a minute to tell you yes, about you current news? Ginny Thomas and Clarence Thomas, and Leonard Leo, all supported a man named John um, Eastman, who is a former clerk of Clarence Thomas and now is uh, one of the co-defendants, the, the uh, people who are on trial with President Trump. Why? Because it, he was the architect of the plan to send the voting back to the states uh, in, in order to stop uh, the vote for President Biden. Really? Wow. Yes. So it just goes on and on. You, you called the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops a powerful lobbying group. How do they lobby? They lobby with a very straightforward lobbying group, you know, with, uh, with, with lawyers and like everybody else in the, uh, uh, who are lobbying in Congress. Uh, they have a, now I'm not saying that Congress people who are Catholic automatically vote the bishop's line, but you know, there are an enormous number of Catholics. I, I, I don't think they outnumber Protestants, but they're right up there, way above the proportion of Catholics in the country. And um, so they're going to give, I mean, it's just human nature. You're going to give a, an ear to the bishops. Uh, so not only uh, in places like the Congress, but also in places like this Napa Summer Institute, uh, they are uh, always lobbying, uh, especially uh, moneyed interests. You know, they have bills to pay. Ordinary parish priests have bills to pay. And these are the people who donate the same ones who get their names on the gymnasiums or on the school buildings. And it's very impractical to say that you don't reach out your hands to people who have money. And often people who have money are involved in the kind of industries that Pope Francis has said need to step back because they are causing climate change, for instance. So you, as you said earlier, it's big money and it's fossil fuels. The Napa Institute that you mentioned, I thought that was a fascinating chapter. They also have a Napa, what do you call it, Napa legal branch where they're involved in litigation. Is that true? Right. And who's the money behind that? Leonard Leo. They also reach out to these apostolates, that is, lay groups who have certain ideas about uh, what Catholicism should be, what capitalism should be. And they are um, providing legal, uh, legal advice for them uh, as well. And they are now connected with Notre Dame, one of the flagship Catholic universities, the Napa Institute is, and they have just opened an office uh, near the Capitol in Washington, D.C. So it, they're, they're not just people who go to drink wine, although they do, uh -huh. <laughs> at the vineyards in Napa. They are also uh, a very powerful part of the lobbying force and, and, and uh, source of dark money. So you, your book probably came out before most of the revelations about Clarence Thomas and Alito, for example. Um, with ethics issues on the Supreme Court, but I wondered what, what might be your opinion about that and, and ethics reform. Well, ethics reform is absolutely necessary. There's no reason why a particular branch of government ought to be exempt from uh, the, the kind of the, the rules and expectations that other branches of government are, are bound to and dare I say, especially the Supreme Court. And so many of those revelations about Clarence Thomas did involve Leonard Leo and the Federalist uh -huh. Society. Uh, oh, yes. Well, it's, it's, no, it's, it's no surprise. I mean, they met early on. I, 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 I show the, the scene in which they met. And um, they're both uh, 
very, very devout Catholics. I would say Leonard Leo is a traditionalist Catholic. Uh, and they have a kind of family background that even though uh, you, you might think would be very different, have a lot in common. Uh, and I talk about that in the book. And it's a true friendship, I believe. Uh, there, there's, it's very poignant about the, 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 the daughter of Leonard Leo, who passed away uh, at a young age. And uh, Thomas keeps a, a picture of her on his desk. You see, the, these relationships are not formed only in you know, these smoke-filled rooms. They're, they're formed in, uh, uh, out, of, out of friendships and uh, those friendships develop mutual obligations. That's why this dark money in the church is so fearsome and why uh, it's in everybody's interest, not just Catholics. This, this is an issue uh, because this is such a, an important conservative group. It's an issue that I think all Americans who are interested in the separation of church and state need to pay attention to. Yeah, we hear about the Protestant Christian nationalists so we're so glad that you've written this book, calling attention to the huge role that the Catholic bishops have been playing in promulgating uh, Christian nationalism, which is such a danger to our democracy. And uh, your sleuthing and investigations are really, really um, uh, impressive. Yes, quite an impressive book with a lot of history and a lot of current events telling us, sort of moving the curtain so we can see kind of what's happening with this notorious U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Thank you so much, Mary Jo McConaughey, for being with us today. Thank you. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because Free Thought Matters. I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.